Good evening, everyone. This is Dr. Marty Ross, and this is another Conversations with Marty Ross, MD, tonight. I um, I see a lot of uh, familiar names, and I see many new names here. So um, glad, for the new people that are here, welcome. And uh, for those of you that are turning, welcome, too. And I'm glad to see you keep coming back. I, I hope you're getting some value out of this. Uh, regarding how these webinars work, uh, you create them with your questions, and uh, they're never the same. So sometimes we get into themes of the night, sometimes we don't. Um, I basically take the questions as they come in to me. Uh, be aware as you write your questions, uh, you can do those, you can write your questions to me on your on the bottom right hand side of your screen, there's a chat box, you can write your question there. This format works best for short questions. And if they get too long, I just, I won't even post them, okay? So just keep that in mind. This tends, I can't I can't solve all of your issues with Lyme disease with one large question. It just won't work here, okay? For those of you that are new, there's actually two ways you can participate. The old timers know this, but the two ways you can participate. One is write a question, be bold, especially on your first visit. The second way to do this is uh, to just uh, listen to the questions. And uh, if you're in the live version, you actually see them written on your screen too and follow those questions and see what kind of responses I give. Uh, many of you know, I, I usually use the question as a way of explaining a number of different things. So um, I sometimes maybe get a little long winded, but uh, there's always a reason behind it, okay? Um, I am creating a recording of tonight's webinar. Uh, you will get an email from me tomorrow morning, somewhere around 9, 9.30 a.m. Um, Central Standard Time, Austin, Texas time, that is, and um, announcing that it is ready. Uh, it'll include the link that you can use to see that recording, but also to include a chance to sign up for next week's webinar. And we're doing uh, three webinars this month. Um, that's what my plans are right now, at least. And so um, tomorrow morning, you'll be able to sign up for that. Do me a favor. Um, if you know people that would get benefit from these webinars, share the information, share the email when it comes out tomorrow. Spread the word about what we're doing here so others can get some benefit as well too, okay? All right. And, oh, last thing. When you write your question, only hit the enter key when the whole question is complete. Uh, every time that you hit an enter key, it actually sends a question to me. Um, and I have to be able to try to piece that together from this side. And it's easier if you just write your question as a long run-on paragraph, and then it gives me a chance, or a short <laughs> run-on paragraph, I should say, and that gives me an easier chance of finding your question. Okay, all right. So let's go ahead and get, I think I covered all the background stuff here. Let's go ahead and get started. Hello, Stephanie. Let's see. Hi, Dr. Ross. I have been on your herbal protocol on your site for Bartonella and Lyme. It's not fully resolving the, the symptoms, but just keeps getting them at bay. Can you add in lower kinase to herbal regimen? Can you also consider methylene blue as well? And would this help in your experience with people on herbal products? Can you take lumber kinase and methylene blue together? All right. So yeah, you can. Um, let, let me kind of just give you some input here. So um, if a Bartonella treatment is working, if you're doing the Sitakuda Hutania that I recommend for growing Bartonella, and if you're doing the liposomal cinnamon, clove, oregano that I recommend for persister Bartonella, if they're working, you should start seeing some decrease in your Bartonella symptoms by about two to three months. If you do not, then it's time to change up that treatment, okay? So just be aware of that, all right? With Lyme, on the other hand, it can take a long time sometimes to see improvements, even if a treatment is working. And there was a study done by um, one of my colleagues that was presented maybe about 12, maybe 15 years ago at one of our annual uh, International Lyme Associated Disease Society meeting. And what was done in that study is people with Lyme, not with Bartonella, not with Bebezi, but just Lyme only, uh, were observed to see how quickly they would turn around. And in that study, they were put on two antibiotics. They were put on clarithromycin and metronidazole. And uh, clarithromycin would go after intracellular Lyme, Lyme that lives inside of cells. It would go after spirochete Lyme and it would go after the third appearance of Lyme, which is called a cyst, okay? Back then, we didn't realize that Lyme also had growth states of all these three forms, 
and had these hibernating persister forms too. So we, we didn't know that back then, all right? But what they did is they looked to see how quick it would be before somebody would start having improvement. And what was observed is that by three months, only 30% of people with Borrelia Lyme had started to have improvements on that regimen. By six months, 60% had improvements and by nine months, 90%, all right? So the thing about Borrelia Lyme, it takes longer to get improvements, okay? And the, probably the reason for the difference between a Bartonella treatment, if it's effective, giving you improvements in two to three months on Bartonella symptoms and Lyme taking maybe even up to nine months is Lyme grows really slow. Bartonella replicates a lot faster and things that grow faster, replicate faster, respond to antibiotics quicker, okay? All right, so I want you to be aware of that, all right? So when you tell me that things are not getting better for Borrelia, that may be okay. For Bartonella, by about two to three months into treatment, you should be starting to see some improvements, all right? So how do you tell what Bartonella symptoms are? So symptoms that suggest Bartonella are can be a number of these, okay? It can be pain on the soles of your feet, uh, severe thinking problems, much worse than your energy problems. So uh, your brain is only working 30% effective, but your energy is still 70% of normal, for instance, okay? All right. Um, also having a feeling of air hunger, that can be a Bartonella symptom. Sometimes that can be a Babesia symptom too, but it can be a Bartonella symptom. Um, having pervasive anxiety, anxiety that's with you all the time. Um, feels like it's organic coming from within you. That's a Bartonella symptom you can follow. And um, the other thing, Bartonella sometimes gives people a feeling of um, vibrating or buzzing on the inside. And, some, and it's nothing anyone can see. It's just a sensation you have. And then finally, another type of Bartonella symptom can be tremors or shakes. Okay. All right. All right. Now, if you are into it, so first of all, I want to be clear. If you are following my protocol for Bartonella, you should be doing Sudakuta, Houtonia, and the liposomal cinnamon clove oregano. For Borrelia, you would be doing cat's claw, otoba, and liposomal cinnamon clove oregano, okay? All right. And if you're not doing that, the cinnamon clove oregano part of this, add that in, all right? All right. So then the question is, what do you do when it's not advancing? All right. So if you're already two to three months in and your Bartonella treatment's not get, getting better, what do you do? Well, definitely, um, I do like having lubricinase in my Bartonella treatments. And the reason I like adding that into the Bartonella treatment is we know that Bartonella can mix with the blood clotting proteins in your blood called fibrin. And when it mixes with fibrin, um, fibrin and these uh, nest of germs, if you will, attach themselves to your blood vessel walls and they kind of hide away. Uh, immune system has a hard time getting in there, right? So we want to break up the fibrin in these fibrin nests and lumber kinase does that. And so you can get it as a product called Baluki. That's a 20 milligram pill or Allergy Research makes a product. It's a 16 milligram pill. Either one of them works at that strength, okay? And I would start at one a day. Um, if And as soon as the herxing, the worsening that you get from increased killing from using that lumber kinase goes down, then increase it to one pill twice a day. Make sure that you're taking it on an empty stomach. So lumbar kinase is an enzyme that breaks down uh, the fibrin protein, okay? But if you take it with other things, it's going to try to break down those other things and won't get absorbed to be used to break down your fibrin nest. So what I tell people to do is to make sure that they take it uh, on an empty stomach, which means do not take anything, uh, medicine, supplement, or food one hour before you take the lumbar kinase through one hour after you take the lumbar kinase, okay? And yes, you could strengthen the treatment by adding in methylene blue. Uh, methylene blue, many of you know, is a, um, well, many of you may not know, but methylene blue is a drug and it's also a clothing dye, all right? So um, in a drug form, it's been approved to treat a condition called methemoglobinemia, uh, which is a condition where your red blood cells, the hemoglobin inside the red blood cells, it carries oxygen. In some people, it doesn't release it well enough, all right? And when people get under medical stress or under um, other forms of stress, sometimes it makes this methemoglobinemia even worse. 
And so what the methylene blue does is it literally, we give it to you IV in an emergency situation and it bumps the oxygen off, okay? All right. We now know from laboratory experiments that methylene blue can be effective at killing growing Bartonella and also these hibernating forms called persisters. We also know it can kill a persister um, Borrelia and we assume, but there's no science that shows this, that it can kill growing Borrelia too. So yeah, I mean, if you wanted to, if your treatment's not working, you could add other agents, as you're suggesting, the lubber kinase to get rid of the fiber nest, and then also the methylene blue as an added agent, um, in addition to continuing those herbs, could shake everything up and get it moving forward. That could be a step that you could do, okay? The other thing you might want to consider, though, if you want to keep doing the herbal track, is um, look at the herb called cryptolepis. Uh, cryptolepis is an herb that we have historically used to treat uh, Babesia, but there were studies that came out of John Hopkins about oh, over a year ago now that showed that it's pretty effective against growing and persister Lyme and growing and persister uh, Bartonella, all right? So what you could do is, is um, for instance, in your regimen, you could continue the cat's claw, but stop the Atoba, and you could continue the Hutania, but stop the Siddha Akuda, and in place of the Siddha Akuda, and in place of the uh, Toba, add in that uh, Cryptolepis. If you're going to use Cryptolepis for um, Bartonella, and Borrelia, the way I like to use it is to dose it at a half teaspoon three times a day. Okay. All right. So that's another idea you could look at. Add in your lumbar kinase and don't put the methylene blue in. You could leave the methylene blue out if you do it um, by, if you add in the cryptolepis, as I was just suggesting. Okay. So there's a number of ways that you can skin this cat, basically. All right. All right. So um, let me do, I'm going to do a screen share here because I've talked about a number of things tonight here. So let's see here, there we go. All right, so as many of you know, I have a Lyme information site, it's called this Treat Lyme by Marty Ross MD. And this is my online Lyme guide where I've broken uh, the things I've written into many different sections, okay? The latest topics I've written about, you can find by clicking on this, the latest, okay? And so if for those of you that wanna know more about methylene blue and what it does and, um, and how to use it, you can take a look at this article called Mighty Methylene Blue for Tick-Borne Infections and More, okay? All right, I, I do a pretty good job reviewing methylene blue there, all right? And then um, in terms of Let's see, I think we're gonna, I'm gonna look at an article I've written called Persister, yeah. Um, here's an article called How to Treat Persister Lyme and Bartonella. And where I talk about methylene blue here, I also talk about cryptolepis, okay? And um, I think I talk, I have all the dosing down in here as well too. Yeah. So here's where I talk about cryptolepis. Here I'm talking, I do a five milliliter dose, but I, I will tell you in this article, I probably need to revise this. I think you can get by with two and a half milliliters, which is a half a teaspoon um, three times a day. Okay. All right. Uh, but yeah, so that gives you some information. And then for those of you that are just looking at this protocol um, that um, she was following. So I have my uh, starting point for a Lyme disease treatment protocol. And um, in terms of the things you can use for Lyme infection, um, there's this part 11 here where I talk about the Atoba and the cinnamon, clove, oregano. And then for the co-infections, um, there's part 12. And here's where I lay out an approach you can take for Hutania, uh, using Hutania Siddhacuda and the cinnamon, clove, um, oregano. Okay. All right. All right, so Stephanie, yes, you can use lumbar kinase, methylene blue together with the herbal protocol that you're on. Okay, all right. 
Um, good luck to you. Hello, John. Let's see. Hi, Dr. Ross. Happy New Year. Um, Happy New Year to you, too. Let's see. I tested positive for tricocetine and equivocal for zerolinone on the real-time test and scored 246 on your yeast questionnaire and positive uh, VCS, visual contrast study, okay? Um, so VCS, everyone, will can be positive if you have mold toxicity. It's a, a test you do on your computer. Um, you can find it at um, Dr. Richie Shoemaker's website called uh, On Mold Toxicity. Ah, we'll look at it. I'll show you how to find that here in a minute. Um, if it is positive, it means that you have toxins in you that could be mold toxins, but not everyone that has mold toxins in them will test positive on the test. Okay, so I just want you to know that. All right, let's see. So you says you paused your other treatments and you're trying to treat the yeast first with fluconazole, nystatin, probiotics. It was okay for two days, but general pain, neuropathy, and foot pain got worse after the third day. And so bad, I had to stop fluconazole after the fourth day. Yay, it's doing something. Took three days off, continuing just the nystatin and improved. Then tried another 200 milligram fluconazole and was worse again within a few hours. What can be done to tolerate the fluconazole what to, uh, already taking curcumin? And two, wondering why I tested negative for gliotoxin if I have major yeast issues. Okay, all right, so good questions. Um, so one thing, all right, so everyone, John uh, filled out a questionnaire I have online. I'll show you where you can find that in a minute, which is a screening tool to see if you might have too many yeast living in your intestines, all right? And the reason I have people do that, I have them do it at the beginning of treatment, um, is if you have too many yeast living in your intestines, it causes your immune system to manufacture and release a bunch of inflammatory chemicals called cytokines, all right? When you have Lyme infections, when you have tick-borne infections, when you have mold toxin illness, your immune system also manufactures too many cytokines. Now, these cytokines are good and bad. At the right level, cytokines turn your immune system on to deal with a toxin or to deal with these infections. Um, but if the immune system isn't doing a good job, it's going to try harder and harder by making more cytokines. And excess cytokines make it so you can't think, give you fatigue, make you hurt all over, interfere with how your hormones work, etc. And basically, the majority of symptoms that you develop when you have Lyme disease, tick-borne illness, and even yeast overgrowth in your intestines is due to cytokine excess, all right? And many people... Um, as part of their illness, have yeast overgrowth in the intestines adding to the cytokine pool. Sometimes people have it before they start treatment, and sometimes as a result of having been on antibiotics and even herbal antibiotics, they will develop yeast overgrowth as well too, all right? So one of the, the tricks I do in my practice is if I've got somebody that's been doing fairly well and suddenly they start doing worse, you have to wonder, did they develop too many yeast in the intestines? And you can develop too many yeast, even if you're on probiotics to prevent the yeast, even if you take Nystatin regularly to prevent yeast, you can still get yeast, okay? So I just want you to be aware of that. So if you have a sudden decline, look to see, are there too many yeast? And um, you. Uh, so a note about my questionnaire, I'll show you in a minute. The questionnaire looks at how many risk factors do you have for too many yeast and how many symptoms do you have suggesting too many yeast? And then it score, you score it up. That questionnaire is better at the beginning of treatment. It's not as useful of a tool if sometime in the past or during your treatment, you've treated yeast, okay? Because remember, a lot of those questions in it are historical. So if you treat yeast once, um, you may have improved your yeast situation, but you're still gonna answer yes to the historical questions, even if you fixed yeast, okay? So later in your treatment, if you've treated yeast sometime in the past and you start doing worse, I don't rely on that questionnaire later because it has these historical questions. What I rely on is just a quick survey to see could there be yeast. So if somebody's got a decline, you wonder could there be yeast? 
And then symptoms that make you think of yeast are increased gassiness and bloating, um, uh, worsened skin rashes and pimples and acne. And the reason that can happen is the intestinal yeast uh, manufacture toxins that get ab absorbed into your bloodstream, interact in the skin, leading to pimples and acne and even um, uh, skin rashes, okay? The other su suggestion of too many yeast is gassiness and bloating. Um, also, if you suddenly get, if you have something sugary and you get really a lot worse as you feed yeast, you will get worse, okay? So that's another clue. And then in women, if you have vaginal itching, vaginal discharge, I suggest you have too many yeast in your intestines as well too, okay? So you kind of just look at those questions to see. All right, so um, so one thing, so then the, one of the main treatments that I use, I recommend to treat intestinal yeast overgrowth is a combination of fluconazole, also known as diflucan, with nystatin and probiotics. And so that's why John is doing that, okay? Um, if you score over 140 in the screening questionnaire, there's a good chance you have too many yeast or you get benefit by treating it, okay? Now, sometimes as you start treating yeast with the fluconazole nystatin probiotics, you trigger a bad Herxheimer reaction. So Herxheimer reaction is the immune system sees these dead bug parts and the toxins and manufactures too many cytokines. So you get worsening of your underlying symptoms, all right? So one thing that could be happening to John is that this regimen with the Vuconazole and it's just getting a massive killing of his germs, all right? Um, and so the general pain part of that and the foot pain could be part of that too, okay? But John, the only thing question I would raise with you is fluconazole um, rarely can give neuropathy as well too. So if your worsening is primarily neurologic pain that gets worse, neurologic pain would have qualities of sharp, stabbing, shooting, piercing, burning, or electrical, it may be you're having a side effect, not a Herxheimer reaction, but a side effect to the fluconazole. Could be, Okay. But if that's not, if it, if it really is just general body pain and it's increased fatigue and some worsening of neuropathy, probably it's not a side effect of the glucosal. If it's not a, if it's not a neuropathy side effect, then I think you can keep using the glucosal. But what you might want to do when you start to take it again is um, go to a 50 milligram pill, which would mean quarter your pill, all right, roughly quarter it. It doesn't have to be perfect, all right? And start at 50 milligrams. And as the Herxine goes away, then you can go up to 100 milligrams. And then as the Herxine goes away, you can advance up to 150 and then up to 200 milligrams, all right? So that's one way you could deal with it, okay? Now, if you decide that the fluconazole is giving you neuropathy, um, don't use it. And in fact, I probably would not use any of the azole alternatives then. Um, which you could look at instead is um, using terbinafine, which is also uh, Lamisil. And uh, I'll show you an article that gives you the dosing on that. Okay. All right. All right. Then, so anyhow, what can be done to tolerate the fluconazole? Cut the dose down. Um, or if it's neurologic injury from it, then you need to change to uh, terbinafine or Lamisil, which is Lamisil. Okay. All right. All right. And then, um, In terms of the glia, so gliotoxin, everyone, is a toxin that is made by mold. And in addition, intestinal yeast can make it as well, too. All right. Um, John, I, even though intestinal yeast make that toxin, doesn't mean they always make that toxin. That's the best answer I can give you on that. Okay. Or the, so anyhow, that, that would be my response to that. Okay. All right. All right, let me do a screen share here. I'm going to show you some things. Okay, so in terms of the yeast questionnaire, the one place you can find it is on my, this is my uh, Lyme protocol. If you were to go to this section called yeast right here, you can see there's this, I'm hovering over this yeast screening questionnaire, all right? And here it is. And if you fill this out and you score over 140 and you haven't treated intestinal yeast overgrowth before, over 140 suggests that you have too many yeast and you would get benefit from treating for too many yeast, okay? All right. 
All right, now, in terms of how you treat too many yeast, your options on that, take a look at my online Lyme guide. Look over here at this yeast section, and um, you can look at this article called Kills and Prevents Yeast, a Brief Guide. And in here, one of the options I go over is the terbenafine uh, lamisil that I was just talking about. Um, and then also there's this other article about how do you determine if it's too many yeast? And you can find my questionnaire here and you can look at the symptoms that I look at when somebody already um, has treated for yeast before to see if they really have yeast that has come back. Okay. All right. So you can, you'll find that right here as well too. All right. All right. Good luck to you, John. Thanks for the question. Hello, Doug. Say hi, Dr. Ross. Um, Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you, too. Thank you. Um, I'm treating for Lyme, BART, and mold toxicity. For Lyme, I'm on minocycline and tonight is all. I'm proving to be a sensitive patient. My doctor had to lower my dosages to 50 milligram each. Minnow is two times a day and tinidazole is one time daily for one week per month. Even at lower doses, tinidazole is very difficult to tolerate and it takes about a week to dissipate once I finish each week of the treatment. I know I could try banderol instead is there anything other than prescription antibiotic or any other agent I could try as well? Or is Banderol as good as it gets? Thank you. All right. So um, so just let me review a few things here. So the Lyme germ, everyone, um, Borrelia, ha exists in three forms. It has three appearances. I kind of co covered this earlier, but there's the spirochete. Uh, which looks like a corkscrew. There's a form of Lyme that moves inside of cells. We call that the L form or intracellular Lyme. And then there's another form of the germ that's a microscopic cyst form of the germ. Okay. All right. Now, these spirochetes and these forms that I just identified can either be growing or they can be in a hibernating state, or we call those persisters. Okay. So persister is not another form. A persister is a growth state. Okay. So I just want to clarify those terms. All right, so the things that we historically have used to treat the cyst form of the germs, one is to use um, an herbal antibiotic called grapefruit seed extract, okay? And that's a 250 milligram pill and you do that twice a day. That's one option. Another option is the herb um, Otoba bark, which is sold is uh, one company carries it as a product called Banderol. So Banderol is Otoba bark. And the other herb called cat's claw, both of those, when used together, have been shown on petri dish experiments to do a good job of killing uh, spirochete and cyst Lyme. They probably get at intracellular Lyme as well, too. So you could do that, too. All right. If in this kind of a situation, what I would probably do instead of using bander on cat's claw is I would give grapefruit seed extract to try. And I would actually take it continuously. I would use it on the same days that you're doing the minocycline. I would do it as a 250 milligram pill uh, twice a day. Okay, that, that's probably where I would suggest going with that. One last thing you could consider is, um, so tinidazole is in a family of antibiotics called the azoles, all right? So another member of that family that could kill cyst is metronidazole and the anti-yeast medication called fluconazole diflucan, we were just talking about it, likely has good assist killing capabilities too, and is not as intense as the tinnitusole. So another option you could look at would be to use uh, 200 milligrams of fluconazole daily. You could either use that continuous or you could do that during the one week you're doing the tinnitusole. Okay, so fluconazole could be a substitute. But if you want to do it herbal, I would I would suggest probably stopping the tinidazole and do the grapefruit seed extract first. That would be my first option for you. A second option could be to do the combination of cat's claw and otoba. And then a third option um, could be to replace that tinidazole with fluconazole. Okay. All right. Um, good luck to you, Doug. Thanks for the question.
Hello, Sarah. Let's see here. Hold on here for a minute. Let's see. Hi, Marty. I've been treating Lyme and Bartonella for over six months now, and I see some improvement, but my mast cell activation syndrome, MCAS, um, seems to be getting worse. The MCAS symptoms I experience include dizziness, stomach upset, blurred vision, extreme fatigue. My question is, once the infections are gone, will this MCAS AS go away or will this be something I will have to manage the rest of my life? I cannot tolerate any mast cell stabilizers, including ketofifen, chromalin, or and antihistamines. I'm currently on methylene blue, azithromycin, bicillin LA, fluconazole, and lubrokinase. Also, is it mandatory to take binders while treating? Can I still get better without them? I just find they make me feel so much worse and increase my MCAS symptoms. Um, all right, so let me unpack a few things here. So um, mast cell activation syndrome, everyone, is uh, like an ongoing allergic reaction in your body. And um, let me explain that a little bit better. So there's a type of allergy cell that's called a mast cell. And it used to be we thought the only thing it was involved in is true allergies, like um, um, allergies to wheat or um, allergies to bee stings, for instance, okay? And what the thing is, is when you have something allergic to, it lands on a mast cell and that causes the mast cell to release histamines. All right. So that's what we historically thought stimulated a mast cell. We now know there are other things that stimulate and turn on mast cells to make these histamines. The biggest thing that turns on mast cells to make histamines is stress and anxiety. All right. So one thing to look at is, are you managing stress and anxiety? Are there things you can do like meditation or um, get somebody to help you walk the dog or what, whatever it is that gives you anxiety or stress, try to deal with that, even if it means going to counseling. Okay. That's one big thing. All right. The second thing that turns on these mast cells are infections like Borrelia, Bartonella, Babesia, intestinal yeast overgrowth. Um, and mold toxicity, all of those things can turn on these mast cells to more easily release things. Okay. So the other things you can do to deal with your mast cell activation are if you have known things you're allergic to, if you know cats you're allergic to, then remove the cats from your environment. All right. If wheat causes you reactions, pull wheat out of your diet. All right. All right. So that's one thing to do. Second thing to do is to take something to stabilize these mast cells, all right? And so mast cell stabilizers, um, the natural ones you could try, and you didn't list them here, a natural one you can try is called quercetin. Uh, quercetin is a bioflavonoid that is found in high amounts in onions, but also is found in other fruits and vegetables. It's a 250 milligram pill. You could try two pills twice a day or two pills three times a day. And that stabilizes the mast cells so they're not as reactive. And in addition, it actually um, helps manage cytokine excess as well, too. Okay, so that's one option for you. Another um, mast cell stabilizer that you could take is something called luteolin. Um, and that's 100 milligrams. You would take that three times a day. You could take that with quercetin. Okay, so that stabilizes the mast cell, right? Then uh, another thing that helps make those mast cells less reactive is something called low-dose naltrexone. So naltrexone is a drug that we historically have used for people with drug and alcohol addictions, uh, but it at low doses, it actually has a number of effects. And one of those is to bind to a receptor on your mast cells called a toll receptor, and it helps stabilize the mast cells. And so it would have to be something made up by a compounding pharmacy. It would require a prescription, but you can start at um, 1.5 milligrams a day. And about every two weeks, you increase it by one pill, working your way to 4.5 milligrams a day. Now, that will take about two to three months to help stabilize those mast cells, but um, you'll get, you can get some good effects. So some things you haven't tried, um, as, from what you wrote at least, is quercetin, luteolin, and possibly low-dose naltrexone. Okay, all right, then... 
The other things we do for mast cell activation is we try to block the histamines after they get released. And to do that, we use antihistamines like the ketofafen, all right, is an antihistamine. It looks like you've tried some other ones as well too, all right? Chromalin that you've got here is a mast cell stabilizer too. It looks like you can't tolerate that, right? So anyhow, look at what can you do to de-stress. Um, look at the, the quercetin, luteolin, remove things that you're allergic to. Consider going on a low histamine diet as well too, okay? And then look at possibly using low-dose naltrexone as something that might help you here as well too, all right? Now, in terms of your question about um, taking binders, no, that's not mandatory at all. Uh, if you happen to have mold toxicity, you may want to be on binders, but if you don't have mold toxicity, there's no reason for you to be on binders, okay? All right, and let's see. Oh, your question about will, will you always have this problem? No, often if you get rid of your infections and your mold toxicity, if you have that and your yeast overgrowth, eventually these mast cells will quiet down. It may take some time, but you can get to the point that you don't have mast cell activation anymore, okay? All right. I think I answered all of that. Yeah. All right. So let me just show everyone an article. So if you want to look and see what I've just talked about, um, I've written it all down and let's take, uh, do a screen share for that. Okay. So this is back at my, um, my Lyme information site. Uh, so take a look in my immune system section here. And if you go all the way down here, there's an article I have called Mast Cell Activation Syndrome in Lyme, okay? And I talk about the things that triggers this to happen. And then I talk about the symptoms you get. I talk about uh, the testing you can do, but testing is poor. And then the treatment is decrease stress, remove allergens, treat your infections, remove your toxins, lower cytokines, and you could do that with the curcumin, but again, quercetin will do that as well too. Work with various antihistamines, stabilize your mast cells, okay? And then um, in this art, I actually need to add the information here about low-dose naltrexone, um, but I would use low-dose naltrexone too. I need to come back and update this article to include that. All right, so then if you're looking for information about low-dose naltrexone, again, I would look in the immune system section here, and here is my article about low-dose naltrexone. And in here, I do talk about how it can be used for mast cell activation. Okay, all right. Uh, but I now see I need to update my mast cell activation article to include that information as well too. All right. All right, Sarah, good luck to you. Thank you for that question. Hello, Tyler, let's see, hi, Dr. Ross. How does the onset and symptom presentations of newly reactivated dormant Lyme compare to that of a new acute stage Lyme case or an acute stage case that has moved to the chronic phase? Are there any patterns to reactivated Lyme that differentiate it? You know, um, generally what my, good question, Tyler. Um, generally what my observation has been is when you reactivate your Lyme, if it, if it comes back again, if you didn't get all the germs out and your immune system did a good job controlling for a while, but then suddenly you start, it, the germ comes out of control. That's what I call reactivated Lyme. Generally, you're going to have a symptom pattern that looks pretty much the same as when you got it the first time. Um, I have not seen any subtle pattern differences that um, help me differentiate that. Okay. All right. Um, good luck to you, Tyler. Thanks for the question. Anna says, hi. Hi, Anna. And Robin says, good evening. Hello, Robin. Thanks for saying good evening.
Hello, Sandy. Let's see, what side effects or complaints have you seen with patients using cholesterol? Ah, good question. All right, so the main problem with col so cholesterol, everyone, is a binder that you can use to remove mold toxins if you have mold toxicity. Okay, all right. Um, briefly, what with mold toxicity, let me just explain why we would even use a binder. So there's about 25% of all people that when they're exposed to a building that has mold in it, they will breathe in the toxins in that building. Those toxins get absorbed into the lung and, and through the lungs into your bloodstream, and then they get trapped there. All right. In 75% of people, what happens is um, certain white blood cells will see those toxins in the bloodstream and they'll tag them. And then other white blood cells will come in and break those toxins down and we never have any trouble with them. All right. But in the 25% of people that have mold toxicity illnesses because they have genetic predisposition problems, what happens is these mold toxins that aren't broken down go to the liver. The liver's job is to clean out fat-based toxins like mold toxins, supposed to detox them out. However, the liver is not able to transform these mold toxins. And so they leave the intestines still as mold toxins and they go out into the, I'm sorry, they leave the liver and they go out into the intestines. And because there's still a fat soluble substance uh, in the intestines, fat soluble substances are reabsorbed again right back into the bloodstream. So you just get this endless loop of toxins. And what those toxins do is they trigger cytokine excess and they can be directly toxic to your nerve and some of your organ functioning as well too, all right? So what we can do is we can grab hold of those toxins when they've made their way out to the intestines so they don't get reabsorbed again, right? And we call those binders. And one of the first binders that was used was cholesteramine. There are other options that are less um, problematic though. So the main problems with cholesteramine is it often leads to constipation. Okay, that's one of the big problems. Um, a second problem is it may um, bind up minerals um, and you can might start seeing some changes to your nails, for instance, but the main problem is constipation. So things you can do for the constipation, you can take magnesium up to 600 milligrams at nighttime if that's not effective enough, you can add in uh, vitamin C anywhere from three grams to 10 grams a day, often will loosen stools up. So you have to find the dose that will work for you. You can use the magnesium and vitamin C together. Okay, All right. Now, if that doesn't work, then I usually suggest people get off the cholesterol and they look at natural options. All right, so the natural options, there are two products I like using that are natural options. Um, well, actually three, but two that are similar. Uh, the two products that are similar is a product called Mycopole uh, by Research Nutritionals and another product called GI Detox by uh, Biocide and Botanicals. Those two products have a number of herbs in them like um, charcoal, like uh, clay, uh, like uh, silica, that actually bind up a whole host of range of toxins. They tend to be less constipating than the cholesterol. All right. All right. Finally, if those are not tolerated, then the least constipating binder that you can use is a um, something called pectin. Uh, pectin is a fibrous substance found in citrus and found in apples, and you can get pectin powders and they tend to be the least constipating of all of these things, okay? All right, um, let me just do a quick screen share here for you uh, to so, so you can see how you might use some of these binders too. All right, so in terms of mold toxicity, take a look at my uh, detoxification chapter. Look at this article called Mold and Lyme Toxin Illness. And down here, um, I talk about the various binders. Um, and let's see, I give you some ideas on how you can wind up using them. Okay, so there is the pectin powder that I mentioned. There's also something called a broad spectrum binder. So there's the GI detox and mycopole by research nutritionals. 
Um, and then there's the cholesteramine. And I talked to you about how to use them. There are specific binders of betonite clay, activated charcoal, and I talked to you about how to use those as well here too. Okay, all right. All right, so let me show you one other thing here. All right, so any of the supplements that I've mentioned tonight, if you're wondering where you can get them or what they are, um, you can take a look at my supplement store. This supplement store is a store I used for my patients when I was treating people back in Seattle, uh, but it still is open to anyone. Anyone can use. These are products I've, I've worked with. I know they work. I trust the quality. I've, I've picked them so that I've uh, selected high quality ones that don't have a lot of garbage in them and have the greatest chance of working. Okay. So in terms of things you can use and help with detoxification, uh, take a look here at this detoxification section. And there's the charcoal I mentioned. Here's the GI detox that I was mentioning. Uh, here's MediClay, which is um, betonite clay. Um, here's this Mycopole that I mentioned. Um, so you can find all my various detox products right here, okay? Oh, the other thing I just point out to you, um, if you're looking for places, feel free to use my store. Um, I have certain advantages that our stores don't have. Number one, I sell at the lowest amount allowed by the manufacturers. Now, um, if I try to sell lower, they're gonna remove my ability to sell the products. The other two things I do to try to make these products more affordable though, is I pay all of your um, shipping costs for people that are in the United States and I cover um, taxes. Um, I, you don't pay the taxes, I pay them for you. Okay, so there's two things I can do to make these a little less costly for you, all right? All right, Sandy, thank you for that question. Hello, Matthias. Hello, Dr. Ross. I've been taking ProBoost for almost a year now. I'm worried I downregulated my own thymus gland production. Every time I try to stop, I feel worse. Is my body now dependent on this supplement? Huh. Um, I haven't seen that happen. Um, so I have, I, I'm not sure that it's dependent. I'm not aware that dependency can develop to this one or your chemical reactions get used to it, okay? There is a problem though in that ProBoost I think is no longer being manufactured. So eventually you're gonna to have to step away from this. If um, something you might consider using instead would be to use, um, I'm just trying to think here. You might consider using a peptide product um, called Thymogen Alpha-1 by uh, Integrative Peptides. It basically um, helps stimulate um, the type of immune cell, the same type of immune cell interactions that the um, a Pro Boost would be doing, okay? And you would use one pill twice a day on that, okay? If you want more information about that, you can take a look at my article that I have on peptides and uh, carry the products in my store as well too. Let me just do a quick screen share and I'll show that to you. All right. So take a look in terms of peptides. Take a look in my immune system chapter, and then take a look at huh. there we go. It's down here. It's this article called Key Oral Peptide Strategies to Repair and Restore in Lyme and Mold Toxicity. And in here I talk about uh, something called thymus and alpha-1 that no longer is available, but 
Integrative Peptides has come up with a product called Thymogen Alpha-1. I'm circling it right here that mimics the thymosin alpha-1, okay? So take a look at that, and I talk about how to use it here, okay? All right. Good luck to you, Matthias. Thanks for the question. Hello, Kim. Let's see. Our question concerns people who have chronic Lyme with Bartonella, mast cell activation, and gastroparesis. Our concern is that binders like uh, Takasumi may also bind minerals and nutrients. Would chlorella be better? Ah, you know, I, I, I don't think, personally, I don't find chlorella to be that effective of a binder. Um, I would take a look at the recommendations I have on the... Um, the pectin powder. Okay. All right. Um, good luck to you, Kim. Thanks for the question. Hello, Anna. Let's see. If I am testing positive for Lyme, IgM, and IgG, and indeterminate Bartonella, what should I treat first? I have been treating for over a year with antibiotics and think that I have Babesia under control. I have vision issues and lots of foot pain. So um, in terms of how do you diagnose, and I want to talk about that first, all right? So um, the way that we diagnose Lyme and the way that we diagnose Bartonella is to consider a few things. Number one, what's your risk of having gotten these infections? For Lyme, if you have had a tick bite, that's a risk. Uh, if you live in an area where there's lots of ticks that carry Lyme, that can be a risk, okay? And you may have gotten bitten by a baby tick and don't even know it. Um, we also look at, do you have a lot of symptoms that suggest Lyme? And then we look to see, do you have supportive tests, okay? So for Lyme, if you have a lot of symptoms that look like Lyme, and if you were bit by a tick and you have these positive tests, yeah, I'd say you have Lyme, right? Bartonella, I know your testing is indeterminate, but an indeterminate test doesn't prove you have Bartonella. I would wanna see if you have enough symptoms of Bartonella to also suggest it too. And I did review those earlier tonight, but again, you wanna to look to see, do you have a lot of foot pain? Do you have severe cognitive impairment, uh, thinking problems that is? Do you have um, uh, periods of air hunger? Do you have any neurologic symptoms, neuropathies, loss of nerve function, tremors or shakes? A feeling of vibrating or buzzing on the inside sometimes can suggest it. Um, do you have a lot of psychiatric issues like ongoing anxiety or depression? You don't have to say yes to all those, but if you have enough of those, then you might say you have Bartonella, all right? What you've written here with the vision issues and foot pain could be Bartonella, might be Lyme. I would want to know more about your symptoms. So I, I, I'm not saying I can tell from what you've written here whether this is Bartonella or not, okay? But to answer your question, you can treat Lyme and Bartonella at the same time. You can treat, you don't have to select which one you're gonna do. You can treat them at the same time, all right? And so you can uh, try to, you, if you're gonna use prescription antibiotics, you can try to use things that would help both, um, or you can do herbal antibiotics that would pick up both, all right? So in terms of Lyme prescription antibiotics that might do both, you can use a combination of azithromycin and rifampin or clarithromycin and rifampin. Those are combinations that are gonna pick up both Lyme and Bartonella. You would also wanna use uh, an herb to go after the persisters that I mentioned earlier, these hibernating uh, state. And to do that, you would do liposomal cinnamon, clove, oregano. Okay, all right. Or, you could do a combination of two herbs. Uh, one would be cryptolepis, and the other one would be Japanese knotweed. And I would also throw in the cinnamon clove oregano too. All right, so the um, cryptolepis, as I mentioned earlier, can treat growing and persister Bartonella and growing persister Lyme. Japanese knotweed can treat growing and persister uh, um, uh, Borrelia as well too, all right? And growing and persister Bartonella. And cinnamon clove oregano also picks up all three of uh, both of those and growing and persister states as 
well too, excuse me. Um, so anyhow, the way you would dose a cryptolepis, half a teaspoon, three times a day. The way you dose a Japanese knotweed would be um, 30 drops twice a day. And the way you would dose a cinnamon clove oregano oil capsule is one pill twice a day. That's an option for you to consider as well too. Okay. All right. Um, good luck to you, Anna. Hello, Sandra. Say hi, Dr. Marty. Thank you for all. You're welcome. I have Babesia Bartonella online for several years. I have had difficulty taking strong antibiotics. Currently, I am on minocycline 50 milligrams a day for a week. Within five days, my whole body was shaking, heart racing, and pain. Does this sound like a Herx or medication response? Also, for the Babesia, what herb would you suggest instead of Malarone? Take a melarone and a cycling is too tough. Thanks so much. All right. So um, I don't know for sure, but uh, minocycline um, in some people causes a lot of neurologic agitation, basically. Uh, so what happens with minocycline is it's a very fat soluble antibiotic, and things that are fat soluble uh, cross over into the brain easily, um, but they also uh, concentrate heavily in the fat sheath that covers your nerves in your brain and, and sometimes can become an irritant, giving you heart racing, giving you increased pain, giving you increased neurologic symptoms. All right. So it is possible this is a medication response. All right. Um, I know that minocycline, I believe, also comes as a 10 milligram pill. I think, it, I think you can get it at a lower dose than the 50 milligram, um, or you can open up your minocycline capsules and just take half the amount, but you could try taking lower dose, even 25 milligrams a day and see if you can tolerate that. But again, be aware, minocycline has these neurologic effects and some people just can't take it for that reason. An alternative to the minocycline could be to do doxycycline instead. It's not as fat soluble. It doesn't tend to give you the neurologic agitation that uh, minocycline does. Okay. Um, in terms of an alternative to malarone, uh, the cryptolepis. Um, the way that I dose cryptolepis is to take it, I dose it a lot heavier or stronger, I should say, uh, for treating Babesia than I dose it for treating uh, Borrelia and Bartonella. So for Babesia, I like people to take five milliliters three times a day. That's the dose I try to work people up to. That's the equivalent of a teaspoon three times a day. And as I mentioned earlier, when I'm using it more for Bartonella and Borrelia, I recommend a half teaspoon three times a day. Okay. All right. So talk these ideas over with your physician and see what they have to say for you. Okay. All right. Uh, good luck to you, Sandra. Hello, Robin. Let's see. I just started the fluconazole doxy cinnamon clove oregano protocol. I'm a little concerned about the safety of fluconazole. This is for Bartonella positive hygienic lab. Ah, got it. Okay. So many of you may know that I've started recommending using the azoles like fluconazole uh, to treat Bartonella. And that is uh, based on research that came out about four years ago that showed the drug called clotrimazole, which is in the same family as fluconazole, <laughs> was quite effective in lab experiments at treating growing and persister Bartonella. Okay. All right. And so about a year and a half ago, I started adding it into my Bartonella protocols and saw a really good improvement from it. And so that's where the fluconazole comes from. Doxy is useful against uh, growing Bartonella and the cinnamon clove oregano is useful against growing and persistent Bartonella. So yeah, this is a good regimen that you're on. Okay. In terms of uh, safety of fluconazole, you know, the um, in theory, fluconazole, there is some risk that it could lead to liver inflammation. Um, I will tell you when I first started using fluconazole years ago, like 20 years ago, and I started making it part of my 
uh, chronic treatments and I was using it daily, I would have people do a blood test every week to make sure that they weren't getting liver inflammation. And the truth is I never saw anyone develop liver inflammation. Nowadays, what I do, if I'm going to have somebody on it for a really long time, about every, about one month to two months after they started, I will check liver numbers to make sure they're okay. And if they're okay, they're going to stay okay. All right. The second major risk factor you have with fluconazole is that some people get hair loss on it and you won't know until you start it. Okay. Those are the two major things I see. I just really, I have found it to be a very well tolerated drug. I haven't found a uh, majority of people, uh, the great majority, the 99% or more people that I put it on never have problems with it. So I'll just share that with you. Okay. All right. Uh, good luck to you, Robin. So to say no, in terms of where Robin came up with that protocol, uh, I'm just gonna do a quick screen share here for you. Okay, so take a look at uh, my Lyme guide, look at the infection treatment plan section. And then in terms of possible protocols to treat Bartonella, take a look at my Kills Bartonella, a brief guide. And in here, I talk about um, persisters. I talk about Bartonella biofilms and I break my treatments into um, different tiers. The strongest ones would be the antibiotic protocols, okay? And so I have ones that I call fluconazole-based treatments. And then I also have uh, rifamycin, rifampin-based treatments. Um, I also have macrolide and tetracycline-based treatments. Anyhow, you can look in here and see where, where she came up with the ideas that I just, she was mentioning, okay? All right. Hello, Sandy. Hold on here just a minute. Let's see here. Do you find benefit using methylene blue alone without taking it in addition to prescription medicine for mitochondria repair? Yeah. So, you know, methylene blue um, has a variety of things that it can do. All right. So one of the things that it can do is it can um, help with this condition called methemoglobinemia. And sometimes in Lyme disease, we put people on medicines that might cause methemoglobinemia. So um, if you go on tofenaquin, for instance, for a Babesia treatment, it might trigger methemoglobinemia. If you go on uh, one of Dr. Horowitz's high dose dapsone protocols, that might trigger methemoglobinemia. And so being on methylene blue can prevent that. Okay, so one thing it helps with is methemoglobinemia. Second thing we can use methylene blue for is it helps treat growing in persister Lyme and growing in persister Bartonella. Okay, so we can use it as a germ killer. Third thing that it does is it um, helps repair damage to um, uh, one of the ener energy complexes, production complexes, actually a few energy complexes in your mitochondria. So it kind of patches um, a, a damage to the system that develops um, cell energy called ATP. So it's a patch to your mitochondria. So you get better energy production by your cell energy factories, and <coughs> it can be quite helpful for energy then, okay? So that's another reason to use it. Another reason to use methylene blue is uh, the data uh, lab experiments show that it's a good job breaking up Bartonella biofilm. And then finally, another reason to use it is it seems to elevate, um, or two more reasons. Uh, one is that it helps, uh, it may elevate uh, a thinking chemical called acetylcholine. Uh, people with Alzheimer's, for instance, have deficiency in um, acetylcholine 
and the uh, methylene blue blocks an enzyme that destroys uh, acetylcholine. So you get higher acetylcholine, so you might get better thinking for that reason. And then finally, methylene blue um, has the ability to, is, is known as an MAO inhibitor, uh, which is an enzyme. And by blocking this enzyme called an MAO, monoamine oxidase uh, uh, inhibitor, uh, by inhibiting that enzyme, you get elevations of serotonin, and, which can help with mood, okay? So methylene blue does a lot of things. I think I showed you my article earlier, but for those of you wondering what else it can do, those are all the things it can do. And I wrote the article so you can take a look at that, all right? So I do find benefit in terms of helping with energy. Um, I do find benefit in terms of helping people with thinking. Um, and um, I do see some mood elevations that happen from using it sometimes too. Okay, all right. Thanks for a question, Sandy. Hello, Lee. Some of your literature seem to indicate Alenia has only one study and is only recommended as a last resort. Is this also true in combination with septin and biaxin? Yes. Um, I just have not. So Alenia, everyone, is a uh, medication that um, was designed to treat intestinal parasites. OK, that's the purpose of it. Um, and its mechanism by which it works, it may have some ability to kill Lyme. And, um, and then some people, because it has antiparasitic functions, think that it should treat Babesia as well, too. The problem is we really don't have any adequate studies showing that it does anything, to be honest with you, in the world of Lyme. Okay. So, so what I would say to you is it doesn't matter what it's in combination with. I don't use it. I, I just doesn't, there's not enough science saying that it should work in, uh, for Lyme or Babesia or Bartonella. And, um, I, I had tried it at one time in my practice for Babesia treatments. I had tried it at one time as part of my, uh, Borrelia Lyme treatments. And I just didn't find it that effective. So, um, it's nice to hope something will work, as many of my colleagues do when they use it, but the, the data behind that just doesn't support it at all. Okay? All right. Thank you, Lee. Hello, Meredith. Let's see. Um, any suggestions to try and get back some taste and smell from COVID and Lyme flare? Huh. So, you know, in terms of COVID, COVID did alter the um, nerve um, or the smell apparatus um, in your nose. And I, I consider that to be nerve injury of that. Okay. So things that I have tried to help with that are basically to do some nerve repair work. And two things I would look at specifically. Number one, I would try glutathione. So glutathione is an antioxidant found in every one of our cells. Its job is to repair damage from the inside, okay? So you can do a liposomal variety of glutathione. Um, the brand I like for that is uh, by Research Nutritionals. It's a product called Trifortify. The reason you want to use liposomal glutathione is the liposomal quality is what helps get better absorption of it, okay? If you don't have liposomal glutathione, a lot of it just gets destroyed in your gut. The uh, Research Nutritionals product called Trifortify has got good science that they've had conducted that shows and proves it is actually absorbed um, and that you get elevated cell levels in your body when you, um, when you use it, okay? So... Um, so anyhow, a teaspoonful once a day of Trifortify orange or Trifortify watermelon. Okay, that's one thing. Secondly, um, I would also, oh, and the reason to use it is if your nerves are injured, they will have exhausted their own glutathione supply, right? Because they will have tried to fix themselves. And so you want to refill the glutathione gas tank. Okay, number two. I would look at trying to repair the injured 
uh, fat mem uh, cell membrane of the nerve, and I would try to repair the uh, energy factories called mitochondria in those nerves. And the product I would use for that is a product by research nutritionals also called ATP 360. And so it has in it the phospholipid fats that make up your cell membrane, as well as the uh, mitochondria membranes. And when you repair that, cells will start working better and they'll start generating energy. In addition to these phospholipid fats, it has a number of micronutrients that help your mitochondria run better too. And that would be to take that as three pills one time a day, all right? Finally, I would probably look at a third thing actually, and that is I'd look at using the peptide called BPC-157. Uh, peptides are short strands of amino acids that are made in our bodies. There have been maybe identified over 100 different peptides now. And this one that's made in the stomach lining called BPC-157 has the ability to repair damaged tissues, including muscles, tendons, joints, and nerves. Okay. And so you can do a one pill twice a day on that. So the protocol, I would recommend three things. BPC-157 as 500 milligrams twice a day. I would look at doing a glutathione of the um, one teaspoon a day of that TriFortify product. And then I would look at repairing your cell membranes and the mitochondria with that product called ATP360. Okay. And give it about a three month try and see if it makes a difference for you. All right. Um, yeah, let's see here. I'll do a quick screen share for you. Oops, I was going to do a screen share. I messed that up. Let's try that again. Okay, so take a look at my store. If we look at the uh, brain and nerves section here, um, you can see I should have. Yeah, so in here you'll find, here's one of the Try Fortify Orange, Try Fortify Watermelon. Here is this ATP 360. And then here is the BPC-157 that I was talking about, okay? All right. Good luck to you, Meredith. Thanks for the question. Hello, Tara or Tara? Obviously, I can't tell. Um, I don't get to ask you how it's pronounced, but hello. Uh, hi, Dr. Ross. Do you find with treatment for Lyme that dysautonomia symptoms improve? Although I have other symptoms, these are the most life-altering for me currently. Thanks. So generally, yes. Um, so dysautonomia means a dysregulation, every one of the... Um, autonomic nervous system or the part of your nervous system that makes adrenaline and anti-adrenaline, okay? And when this becomes dysfunctional, you can have, it can be called dysautonomia. Sometimes it goes by the name called POTS, which stands for uh, paroxysmal orthostatic tachycardic syndrome, uh, which means that when you stand up, your heart races or your heart may just take off racing on its own a lot. Uh, but people that have POTS and dysautonomia, generally it's infections that trigger it and eventually the nerves will uh, gain back a lot of their function again. Some things you can do um, that from an alternative medicine standpoint to help with the dysautonomia is low dose naltrexone has some benefit. Um, and um, I think I showed that article to you earlier tonight, but you wanna start at 1.5 milligrams a day um, and try to work up to 4.5 milligrams a day uh, over about six weeks. Uh, four weeks that is, and um, but you're gonna need to give about six months to see if it's gonna help you, okay? Other things that you can do is increase salt in your diet. Um, you can use pressure stockings, doing light exercise sometimes can be helpful. 
Um, if you have a problem with your heart racing, that's the main problem of this. You can use a family of medications called beta blockers will sometimes help slow your heart down. Sometimes uh, we have to give you um, uh, a type of steroid that helps hold more salt in your body so that it'll expand your blood. Uh, but there are medications you can use that a cardiologist or neurologist would prescribe for this, okay? But um, from a natural standpoint, I like using the LDN. Um, the other thing, um, yeah, that, that would be the main idea I'd have is the LDN for that. Okay, all right. Um, good luck to you, Tara. Hello, Sheldon. Hi, Doc. I have an autoimmune condition called sarcoidosis. I have, I'm have, i having sleepless nights most times three hours. Any recommendations, preferably natural supplements? Yeah, you can take a look at... Um, there's two supplements I would show you. Actually, let's just do a screen share. I'll show them to you. All right, so take a look. This is my store again. And take a look in the supplement section here and then look in the sleep section. All right, and so I would either look at this one called the sleep formula or this one called circadian PM. You could use either one, okay? Um, <clears throat> they have, let's see, let's look at the circadian. So the circadian PM is a little more extensive in terms of the ingredients that are in it. It's got some glycine, valerian, uh, curcumin, lemon balm, um, a number of things. L-theanine is in here. Um, so I would, this is a good one. And you can work, the suggested dosing on this is to take um, three capsules before bed um, another option, again, would be to take a look at that sleep formula that I showed you earlier. But these are nice starting places for you. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry to yawn there. <laughs> the sleep question made me sleepy. Uh, let's see here. Hello, Diane. Let's see. What do you recommend for treating Morgellons disease? I have new skin ulcers popping up daily. I have worked on eliminating yeast and no longer have sugar cravings. So I don't think these lesions are due to that. All right. So um, Morgellons is a tough condition. It's a, a skin condition where people get breakdown of their skin. Um, sometimes these lesions that develop um, will have fibers coming out of them. And um, we, we really don't have uh, these, the lesions I've been studying, trying to see, is there a germ growing in them that causes it? And the only thing that really has been identified is that often there, this is, um, if you were to biopsy these, you might find um, Borrelia. Uh, we tend to see a lot of people where Jolens have Borrelia, have Lyme, okay? And what we have found is the way to get this under control is to treat Lyme. Um, that's about the best thing we have at this point. And so um, if you're starting to get skin ulcers showing up, then it may be time to approach one of your providers to look at getting on some type of a uh, Borrelia treatment, uh, anything. It could be, you could do it herbally if you want, or you could do it uh, with prescriptives, but be back on a treatment to deal with that. And I would also make sure that part of that treatment includes agents like the cinnamon clove oregano that will help go after the persister form of Lyme as well too. Okay, all right. Um, good luck to you, Diane. Hello, Naj. Let's see, I have severe small fiber neuropathy what can be done to help heal my nerves? All right. So Naj, um, I, I spoke earlier to somebody that was having problems with their, um, post-COVID having injury to their 
uh, smelling and taste. And I said, that's a neurologic injury. All right. So the recommendations that I gave them to fix neurologic injury is the same thing I would tell you. I do the ATP 360, uh, three pills one time a day. I would do the uh, liposomal glutathione as the Triforta product, one teaspoon once or twice a day. And I would look at trying BPC-157, uh, one pill uh, twice a day as well. And I would give all of that three to six months to see if it's going to work on this kind of a condition, okay? In addition, make sure that you've been investigated to see if you have mold toxicity um, that uh, could be poisoning those nerves. And I would also consider whether you've got Lyme or Bartonella going on, causing some of the destruction as well. And if you do, you need to treat for those infections with herbal or prescription antibiotics as well, okay? But to do the specific nerve repair, ATP 360, the Trifortify product I mentioned uh, for the glutathione, and then the uh, peptide BPC-157, okay? All right, um, good luck to you. Hello, Michelle, hold on here a minute. Let's see here. Hello, Dr. Ross, my 16 year old daughter is currently being treated for Lyme and BART. Her current treatment plan is Baluki, Japanese knotweed, cryptolepis, Berber, Panella, uh, glutathione, lysine, cytoquel, adrenal distress, reactivated or um, magnesium, vitamin C, vitamin D, iron, uh, mega IgG, mega micro balance, Udo's oil and a probiotic, azithromycin doxycycline. She is responding well. I want to transition her off the doxy. She can't tolerate more than two months at a time. Any suggestion for a good herbal replacement? She can't tolerate cinnamon, clove, oregano, or fluconazole. Thank you for all you do. You know, um, boy, she's on a lot of killers here um, to go at this. I don't think she needs to be on this many be honest with you. Um, usually I run my Lyme and Bartonella treatments with about three antibiotics at a time at most. All right. So I think you'll probably just stop the doxycycline and not replace it with anything. Clearly this regimen's working for her. And I would just make one change, stop the doxycycline and see if staying on the crypto, the knotweed, um, as your germ killers and the azithromycin um, are enough to bring her forward, okay? Keep in mind the knotweed and the crypto are gonna pick up growing and persister forms of Lyme and Bartonella is gonna do both. So um, yeah, and they're gonna get at intracellular and spirochete Lyme, which is what the doxycycline was doing too. So I, I, I would just stop the doxycycline. That's a lot of stuff she's on. I don't know that you need to quite be on all these things, okay? All right, um, good luck to you. Obviously, talk it over with her doctor. I'm not your doctor, okay? So I don't know everything here about your, your daughter, but that, that would be my observation, okay? Hello, Shadia. Let's see. Hello, Dr. Ross. What experience with any of our patients, if any, have you had with high-dose vitamin D protocol treatment? And also, how high a dose would you suggest? Thank you. You know, I haven't done a high-dose vitamin D treatment, and I'm not familiar with it, to be quite honest with you. So I'm not sure. I mean, I like giving vitamin D to my patients to try to keep their vitamin D3 levels uh, or D, uh, vitamin D25-hydroxy, which is vitamin D3, uh, between 40 and 80. Um, that's what I like to do. So I'm not sure if that's what you're calling high-dose vitamin D. But I find that keeping vitamin D more in that range, if we look at some of the research, probably is better for uh, hormonal function, immune function, organ function, et cetera. So that's what I do. But I'm, I'm not sure if that's what you mean by high dose vitamin D protocol or not. Okay. All right. Uh, thanks for the question, though.
Hello, Molly. Let's see. I was diagnosed with Babesia and Bartonella two months ago. For the last two months, I have been on azithromycin, rifampin, doxy, nystatin, hydroxychloroquine, probiotics, sassaparilla, centopolygonum, milk thistle, inflammation support, isastis root, hutania, and uh, Siddha Akuda. This week, I went off the doxycycline and started methylene blue. And this week, I'm taking full doses of isastos root, Hutania and Siddha Akuda. Since I started this Monday, the brain fog and fatigue has gotten better, but I haven't found much relief in my symptoms and the leg muscle pain, horrible foot pain, which makes it hard to walk. As I am typing and you are talking about yeast, I have that issue too. A month ago, I took three days of fluconazole, which wasn't fun, but it helped. Should I take it again? Can I take it at night to lessen dizziness? And how many days should I take it? Also, do you think I should keep taking hydroxychloroquine? Also, would ozone IV therapy help? Any other recommendations? Okay. So there, I would have to ask you a lot of questions and give you the best advice here. So I'm just gonna give you a few things to think about, okay? So first of all, regarding ozone, um, I don't support it. Um, and let me tell you why. So if you were to take, uh, so ozone's not actually an effective germ killer, all right? Now, let me tell you why I'm saying that, all right? So it is true. If you take a test tube full of germs in a lab and you pour ozone in there, you will kill all of the germs, all right? But those same studies have been done taking a test tube full of germs, putting a small amount of your blood in it, and then putting ozone in, and there's no killing at all. And the reason there's no killing is that your blood is loaded with antioxidants that neutralize the oxidation killing effect of ozone. All right, so it's not a germ killer. People do feel better when they use ozone though, and the reason they do is it results in better oxygen delivery to your cell energy factories called mitochondria and you get better energy so you feel better, okay? The problem with doing IV ozone is it's an oxidation agent. So it's probably damaging your tissues if you do a lot of it. So I just, I just don't support it. I support using it maybe to get better energy but up to about eight treatments and I wouldn't do more than that, okay? But I would not use it as a germ killer, all right? Um, in terms of the fluconazole, when you use it to treat yeast, you need to treat for at least 30 days. Three days is not going to be enough to have gotten rid of your yeast problem, okay? And so usually I will do uh, fluconazole um, as a 200 milligram pill, one pill a day for 30 days, along with nystatin, two pills twice a day for 30 days as well too, okay? So um, I don't think you treated long enough on that. Um, in terms of one observation about your protocol, you're really not doing anything that is strong for um, Babesia. You've got a treatment that's quite effective against uh, Bartonella, and that would be the azithro, the rifampin, the doxy, um, the hutania, the Siddha Akuta. All those things are going to be, oh, and the methylene blue. Those are all be great for Bartonella, but methylene blue is not effective against Babesia, even though it has been, it's been used against malaria, but it's not effective against Babesia, okay? And the hydroxychloroquine, which was designed to treat things like malaria, is not that effective against Babesia either. Um, you're really not on a anything that is strong for Babesia here. Um, I would uh, have your, take a look at the article I've written called Kills Babesia and look at either adding in malarone into this regimen or adding in um, cryptolepis, which is an herb, okay? But you'll find those in my article. It's called Kills Babesia, a brief guide. Just, you can look that up at my treat Lyme site, okay? All right. Um, I might have other comments for you too, but I, I would need to ask you a lot of questions here. Okay. All right. So um, good luck to you.
All right, everyone, that is it for me for tonight. Um, we've had a good hour and a half here, and uh, I got to go ahead and feed myself and get a couple of Basinjis. Um, that's, that's them. Those are the Basinjis. That's the painting of the Basinjis, but they're roaming my house here somewhere, looking at me, ready to get uh, their walk-in. So I got to go do that. Anyhow, it's good to be with you here tonight. Um, I hope you got some useful information. Uh, keep an eye out in your email tomorrow morning. And in that email, you'll have an opportunity to sign up for next week as well, too. And then finally, one thing I just want to remind everyone. So I think many of you know, but I have a whole online support group that I'm running for people with Lyme disease. It's called Lyme United. And I'm looking for members. Um, if you think you're getting great benefit here, if you join Lyme United with all the support I do for people there, you're going to, it's like doing my webinar on steroids. Okay. So I'm encouraging people to join our group where we've got about 50 members. I want to see if I can work up to about 200 members. Uh, the more active the community and the more numbers we have, the greater help people are going to get. So join us. Okay. And so let me just do a quick screen share. If you want more information about Lyme United, uh, I'll just show you that here real quick. Take a look at my Lyme information site, and here's my page about what Lyme United is, okay? Um, again, join us. Um, again, if you're getting benefit here, you're going to get a lot more benefit if you join the Lyme United group, okay? All right. Uh, good night, everyone. Uh, great being with you here again tonight. And, oh, I got to go back. I got to go back to the webinar page to get out of here. There we go. All right. Good night.